All right, everybody, thank you for coming back. It is 210 to 12 um, on our clock. And we are taking up this on H244, which is our um, bill related to authorizing the natural organic reduction of human remains. And um, we have with us today Warren Hibbert from OPR. Welcome back, Warren. We have Bob Burr from mm. Veterans Affairs. And I see Chris Palermo, who's been very patient here to, uh, mm. to uh, witness this testimony. When we last took this up, we um, had heard from Chris and from Patrick Healy. We had gotten an email, we had requested the Department of Health for testimony, but they they did not they 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 chose not to deny that or ch chose not to testify. Um, they did say that whatever came out of this bill, that they would be in a position for dealing with whatever regulations they have to set up. It seems like a real hands off. I you know I'd like to see if we can get them on record for saying that, but outside of an email, I mean, we so we have an email on record. But um, Lauren had expressed a desire to testify on this because OPR has an interest in, in um, licensing part of this or discussing the ins and outs of this. So I will turn the microphone to Lauren. Welcome back. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. For the record, my name is Lauren Hibbert. I'm the director of the Office of Professional Regulation, and we do have an interest in organic natural reduction. Um, on whole, um, we support innovation in our regulated professions. We want to support innovation. We want to um, we want to encourage. Um, scope expansion and, and growth in the way that um, programs are operating. Um, and, you know, I've been in front of this committee so much, it almost feels like I don't need to give an overview of what we do, but, um, you know, we are, we exist to protect the public. So um, as long as the public is protected, we can generally support um, growth. And for funeral service specific to natural organic reduction, um, we do think that we can protect the public um, with this new program. Um, we think that it can be safely regulated and, um, and should be made available to consumers who would prefer that type of um, disposition. Um, we have been in communication with the Department of Health um, about the parts that impact them. We've also conferred with the Funeral Directors Association, um, which we, we just appreciate those collaborations. Um, obviously the history of funeral services has been um, either burial or cremation. Um, and natural organic reduction is not the first alternative form of disposition that's been authorized. Um, this body incorporated alkaline hydrolysis, um, which is an environmentally responsible chemical disposition of um, dissolution rather of remains, but it is still a disposition method. Um, and that, when that statutory authority and that's, um, that whole program was added, um, the, the definition of crematory was amended to include alkaline hydrolysis, um, the definition of crematory establishment, and that's in 26 VSA uh, 1211A1. Um, it was also, there was corresponding amendments adding the service to a limited services establishment, um, and today a crematory establishment can offer alkaline hydrolysis. Um, it's our understanding that none have, but that doesn't mean that they can't. They can't. They can at this point. It's just the marketplace has not um, made that switch. Um, we would support, as I've said, adding um, natural organic reduction um, as a method of disposition, but we would ask that. Um, we, we do it in a different way, that the statute be worked on. I, I would wanna work with Ledge Council so that we can um, take what has been previously called um, crematory establishment and cremation and make it disp disposition and then put endorsements on the disposition that's non-embalming. Um, so alkaline, crematory and natural organic reduction because there's going to be new, um, methods of disposition that continually keep coming. Um, and 
if we just keep adding, it's really just a, a practical thing. If we keep adding different forms of burying people or um, disposing of people, um, then we are going to create a statutory confusion and quite, I mean, this bill um, is quite long and it's because it's modifying so much of the language. And we think that it'd be possible to do fewer modifications in the future when the next type of burial um, comes to fruition. So we'd like to, to modify what, I'm sorry, I just need to switch to my uh, notes here. We'd like to modify what is currently a crematory establishment um, and make it a disposition facility and then use endorsements or specialties on that um, title for crematory, alkaline, and natural organic reduction. And I'm happy to answer questions about that, um, but from an operations um, standpoint, that would make um, would would help OPR and perhaps the marketplace. Thank you. Thanks for being here. This is um, quite complex, especially if you don't know much about this industry. So. Um, the personnel who work at this industry are licensed, is that correct? That is. We, we regulate the business and the individuals in this profession. And by regulating the business, um, does the business also have to have a type of license? Yes. Okay. Um, and if the business and the individual working at the business needed to expand, would they have to get additional licenses? No, well, currently the way the bill is drafted, yes. Um, but the way that I'm proposing an amendment, no, they would just apply for a new specialty on their license, um, but they would still hold the same license. That's what I thought you were getting at, okay. Um, and will you provide, or have you provided, yes, you have provided um, wording for that? Yes, it would be or, a disposition facility. Okay, did you submit anything to our committee? I thought I saw you on here, but I guess I don't under documents. You did not I have, submit that. I have not um, okay. submitted anything. I can, um, if the committee would like, but I more what I would like to do is be able to work with Ledge Council to work through what an amendment would look like if this committee was open to it. But I didn't wanna begin that work, which will be um, substantial unless this committee was open to that work um, because we can implement the program as is, as this bill is written. I just think um, statutorily, linguistically, there's a simpler way to do it and a way to build it for the future, not just up for this particular issue. Thank you. Lauren, in a case where, where we would make a general phrase disposition facility and then and then have endorsements, is there, there were, I'm assuming, I know I shouldn't, but I'm assuming that, that the language would be written in such a way that it's if you start with three, if you start with crematory, alkaline hydrolysis, and natural um, reduction, that there might be the language that might follow is, or any other method that dot, 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 you know, I mean, anticipating that other methods may be developed over time. I mean, that's what you're trying to address here. But that, we, if it was that broad, we wouldn't have to keep coming back and adding the, the simple names, even to these, as an add-on. I mean, it, it, we're trying not to come back with this. I think that you still, I don't think that you would want, let me rephrase, let me stop. I would not recommend that you just allow every type of burial as they come up. I would recommend that disposition facility include crematories, alkaline hydroxy, ah, that word is so hard for me, alkaline. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, natural organic reduction, and that that list be amended in future sessions when the next type of burial practice or disposition practice um, arises, which we, we know will happen, innovation happens. Um, but I do think that um, burial and, and um, 
disposition are important. They have health um, ramifications. They have moral ramifications. They have um, space ramifications in cemeteries. I think, and I, those are just the three that come off the top of my head and you have others here with you that are experts in this industry and I am not one. Um, so I just think that this is a conversation that when the next form of disposition or burial arises, the legislature should contemplate it and should make sure that the public can be kept safe, that, um, that it's being done in an appropriate way. Um, so I wouldn't recommend, you know, an open door, I would recommend a defined list that can be amended in future sessions. Good, no, that's good, thank you. Um, any further questions for Lauren at this time? Um, so the question that we have, that you have for us is to, uh, is to contact our legislative council to give permission? Well, just if I I was not able to come on the day that you previously had scheduled testimony, I don't want to hold you up, but I wanted this is my recommendation. This is the change that I will continue to want. And I just wanted to engage with the committee on timing and, and how do you want me right. to do this and just try to engage. Fine. With I mean, the, time is, the, the time is now. I mean, it's yes. it's this bill thus far. You know, it still needs review. It still needs to be scoured a little bit. You know, we have to make choices if we want to go to a fifty-page bill or a five-page bill. Because um, I know that I know that Katie had mentioned that you know just just because she was in the bill, she was updating some other language as well. But um, I'm inclined to. I'll send an email to Katie and you to just sort of say if you want to connect. Is now we're, we haven't started markup on this yet, so now would be the time to contemplate that 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 particular change. So, um, if if it's okay with the committee, I'll I'll you know just send a note to to our attorneys to make that connection. Appreciate. Okay. No, nope, I agree. Yeah. All right. Thank you, can, Lauren. Um, can I can I just say one more thing? I just want to be sure. clear that that this change would not require any crematorium or um, industry that offers crematory services to change their name, to change their advertising. Um, we, would, we would define disposition services as crematory services um, so that it wouldn't have huge ripple effects on the industry. It would be more a back end um, statutory construction, just um, so that I can soothe um, my friend, Chris Palermo. I just want him to hear me say that crematories will still be able to, to offer and say they're crematories. Um, this is more just what is printed on the license and what somebody applies for. Sure. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, you're more than welcome to stay and listen to the testimony from, from our friend, Bob, as well. I plan to. Um, I've never met Bob, so I plan to hear from him. Yes, thank you. Okay, and and um, Chris, your hand is up. Do you want to you want to just comment before we get to Bob? Um, yeah, I just want and this is really for Lauren. Uh, I just wanted to make sure. Are you aware of the questions that I raised in testimony prior? Just I just want to make sure that that's in the pipeline, so that you know everybody involved, whether it's the facility or funeral service understands the parameters of how we function once this um, form of disposition comes to fruition. Yes, I am aware. I watched your testimony. I made quite a few notes. I think a lot of those concerns need to be um, resolved in rulemaking around this new form of disposition. So we'll, we will have rulemaking authority under this bill. We'll have to um, engage in rulemaking to resolve a lot of the, the issues, really important issues that you raised. Yep, perfect. That's all I really needed. Thanks. And just an example of rulemaking versus legislating so that you can have the flexibility to really focus on what's unique to that particular industry. Okay. Well, welcome to Bob Burke. Um, Bob, I'm going to take the opportunity. This is, uh, we, we didn't, haven't seen you much recently, but I just wanted to um, reintroduce the committee who's here. And um, we'll start with Representative Howard. 
Good afternoon and welcome. I am um, Representative Mary Howard. I represent um, the Southwest section of Rutland City, District 5-3. Thank you. Hi, Bob. We've uh, seen each other a lot uh, over the years. Um, Chip Triano representing Hardwick Standard and Walden in the Northeast Kingdom. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you. Uh, good to see you, Bob. Uh, Rep. Matt Byron, Virgens, represent Northwest Addison County. Good afternoon, Mr. Burke, Representative Lisa Hango. Nice to see you again. Um, the northern border of Vermont with Canada. So four towns, um, Richford, Berkshire, Franklin, and Highgate. Did Bloomley from uh, the south end of Burlington. I had to think about that. <laughs> well, Mr. Burke, John Kalaki, South Burlington. I'm Joe Parsons. I represent the towns of Topsom, Groton, and Newberry. Good to see you again. I'm Tommy Walsh from Berry City. Indeed. Barbara Murphy, serving Fairfax, uh, District Franklin, too. Tom Stevens from Waterbury, representing Waterbury, both in Huntington and Beals Gore. Um, Bob, we've had you in in the past. Um, uh, one of the things that the VA for the Veterans Affairs. Not, not the big VA, but our little VA um, <laughs> handles is the um, you have oversight of the physical plant at the cemetery in Randolph, and which has been a which has been a recurring field trip. So perhaps this spring we can make our way down there um, now that we've met again in person, um, and then stop in Randolph on the way back for a free meet. But the um, the. <clears throat> this legislation, the questions that arose were about the con this, this new this new concept of disposition and whether or not I think the direct question for the cemetery was whether or not you would need an, uh, an addition to your active 50 permit, what would it take? What would we have to understand in order to take um, you know would you if, if the family wanted to donate a cubic yard of, of composted remains, uh, which is what, an individual generally would be. Um, how would the cemetery? How would our how would our veteran cemetery handle that? So I believe after reading, you know, through the Active Fifty permits from nineteen ninety one and on, um, and and I think that Chris had mentioned it before. We are the only cemetery in Vermont that that operates uh, in accordance with an Active Fifty permit. So I did some benchmarking uh, with my colleagues in Washington State, which is one of the places where organic natural reduction is permitted. Um, so at the Washington State Veteran Cemetery, they have a scattering ground. We do not have a scattering ground at the cemetery in Randolph. Um, I would need to construct that. So that would require uh, an Act 250, primarily because there's a lot of ledge at the cemetery and drainage and, and composition of the soils needs to be correct um, in order to have scattering for cremains or some sort of organic natural reduction. Can we take a step back and just can you explain to us historically why? I mean, I think you may have just answered the question about why this cemetery has an Act 250 permit when no one else may. Um, and I and I hear I just heard about the sensitivity of the of the topography of the soils and whatnot in, in where the cemetery is located. Were there other reasons why why it is this way? It, it, you know, the the history is is fairly light in in the amount of material to support it. Um, just one of the things that, that caught me um, in reading the land use permit, you know, it says the permit, the permittee shall protect the Randolph Center Fire District Wellhead Protection Area. So the majority of the cemetery is, is located over an aquifer and has a couple of different wetlands and exclusion areas. Um, so you know, it was originally talked about all corpses shall be embalmed. That was later repealed because that was changed, placed in caskets and in sealed concrete structures. Uh, all burials will take place above the seasonal high water table. So, we, you know, 
from from reading that and not being involved in 1991 when it all took place, you know, my understanding has to be that it was a watershed area and they were providing due protection for that area. So as if this bill passes, basically um, you would need to go, you would need to apply either if you were to accept these cremains, if you were to make it a policy that a veteran could donate or have their soil, the compost spread in Randolph, that you would, in order to accept that, you would need to um, just apply to adjust your, your permit. I'd need to apply to adjust my permit, but, but it would be part of the application or the bigger part of the application would be for an expansion and construction of a scattering garden, right? So it's not, you, you can't just put it into existing garden beds, um, you know, cause you wouldn't do that with cremains. It, you know, it has to be a dedicated scattering area. Okay. And so, all right, and, and did the, how big would that be, do you think? I mean, how, how what does Washington State do, did they say? They, they, they didn't say on their area. Um, I mean, it, 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 it would have to be substantial because you don't want to be adding on to it every two years, five years, 10 years even. You know, so you'd have to, as we did with, this, with the cemetery expansion, there's a hundred year plan. So you'd want at least a 50 year plan, um, you know, to, to, to make an, an area and then look at, you know, where would it be? You know, what's it gonna to cost to maintain, et cetera, et cetera. But until that, until you got, until you found that there was a demand and that you needed to provide a scattering garden, the, the veteran cemetery wouldn't be accepting these remains until, un, until all of that process is happening. Whether we, you know, we, if and when we pass this bill, it'll just, if someone asks you, you'll not be able to receive their remains until, until you've made that decision to receive the remains and done all the work. Correct. You know, it's very, very seldom um, that we get a call asking if we have a scattering garden or not. Um, so, so the demand signal, you know, from a financial point of view, the demand signal isn't there. And, and even from a service provider standpoint, you know, the, the demand signal is not there to, you know, to expend the financial you know, efforts um, to do that. Okay, and, and I guess it's, yeah, go ahead, Representative. Well, I was just gonna say, when we speak of the, um, the context, that, the few that you have had about a scattering garden, I'm, I'm maybe making the wrong presumption, but that, that it would be of um, cremains rather than these particular, um, I mean, this is a very large amount that this ends up generating is what we've come to understand that, that you're not talking about the typical urn of remains that we think of with um, cremation. So I, I, I'm just curious if what you've had people request of you for scattering garden is more in the sense of the urn. Correct. It, correct. It was, it, it's cremains. Because I think that that's one piece too that is very different in this, in that it's the volume that we're discussing of each individual. It multiplies the amount of, of to be disposed rather than diminishing the quantity of our body. Correct. Representative Trial. So Bob, do you have any idea of how involved uh, the 250 Act 250 process might be in order to uh, initiate um, a, cr a cremains garden or a composting garden or and or how long it may take and I see you smiling and I'm guessing that this is <laughs> a question that has no answer. <laughs> Having a little chuckle for myself here. Yes, um, I can see. <laughs> you know, the, the, the ballpark, well, it, first of all, we'd have to come up with a plan, right? So you've got to have your drawings, you've got to have all your surveys done, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, realistically, I'm, I'm going to throw out 12 months. And prior to even putting a shovel on the ground, finding funding, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Well, you mentioned a hundred year plan and it got me a little bit uh, curious. 
And, and of course, knowing the VA at uh, the time doesn't really surprise me all that much. Yeah, but it's not about taking a hundred years to get it done. No, I know. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Your plan, it was the plan. Yes, right, exactly. In that, I, Bob, I have to say that is really one of the oddest things to, when we, we were talking about the expansion that you just completed a couple of years ago, where it was like, this is just phase one of a hundred year plan. And I'm like, where else is there a hundred year plan for it? Yeah, well, that's what got the funding. So that's what we did. <laughs> well, we also deal with 250 year old cemeteries here in Vermont. So, you know, that's, that's why there's a hundred year plan. Uh, Representative Kalaki. Is it a problem that um, people choose this form they would understand that then their body, their, those remains could not be dispersed with the veterans mm -hmm. cemetery. That could be at, at this yeah. point in time. <laughs> yeah. It was there. Okay. At this point in time, I mean, if enough people, again, if, if enough people, I mean, through their, through it, it sounds like through their process, if enough people approach the cemetery and say, mm -hmm. this is something we want, and this is the same concept of this, of this um, legislation. There's no, facility that we're trying to approve, we're just approving <laughs> the concept so that people can then make a business decision whether or not they would, that they would do this. Yep. And I think that, so that, so the incoming on the funeral director side and the crematorium side is different than the receptors of the, the where you, where you dispose of the remains. And so, um, like everything else, I'm sure it goes hand in hand. But Act 250 does not regulate any other cemeteries. It's just I, that one. Just that. Just this one. Is that right? Okay. Thank you. That's my. That's what Dave told me. Okay. Thanks. So, in other words, another cemetery. Every other cemetery could accept these. They could make their own scattering gardens. They can make. They can say, "Yeah, put, put them in the woods," or. Put them in this garden here, and we'll use. You know, I mean, they can do whatever they need. They would want to do. Of course, the family would be just donating them. Right. Right. That's what we learned is that there's no commerce involved. Right. Um, well, it just seems. I understand the situation in the veterans, but around the water tables, but it seems that there must be other cemeteries in Vermont that are near water tables as well. And this, this is not putting something in a container, either a casket or a urn. No, but it's also been, it, there's nothing in it. It's mulch. <clears throat> it's right. a cubic yard mulch. mulch. Yep, it is mulch. We have, we have, a, um, we went through, when I was on our um, advisory board for um, land use, we um, allowed or permitted someone who was doing large animal and, and, you just hill it up and mm -hmm. eventually yeah. you just have rich earth. I mean, it, okay, got it. Got it. Oh, thank you. This is Representative Hango and then Representative Hango. Um, okay, so two things that uh, just ran through my mind. The second of which was Representative Murphy is actually talking about the process of creating this, which would not happen at the cemetery. The process of creating the compost would happen at a facility that's contained. Yep. So that has nothing to do with the Act 250 issue that you're talking about with the water table, Representative Clacky, and my experience with Act 250, and I think this might be the case, is that the Veterans Cemetery in Randolph is large enough that it would cause Act 250 to be triggered. That's the key, whereas some other cemeteries that might not that might be on a water table do not trigger Act 250 because of their size okay. or lack thereof. Yeah, that's like a footprint. Yes. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. And if I could add something else, I think the one year, 12 month uh, Act 250 process is optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really, just from experience from development projects I've seen, it's really more like 18 months to two years. It's just for the paperwork. It's a little bit better if you already have one. So then you're just doing an amendment. So I, I'm being optimistic. 
<laughs> we like optimism. Yeah. We gathered that, though. <laughs> I believe that I believe that it's easier to get an Act Two Fifty permit for housing for the for the deceased than it is for the living. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't have to hook them up to municipal water sewer. That's right. <laughs> right. So, um, Rob, so Bob, you can tell it's getting to be the end of the week. Um, yeah. Okay, so just one more thing, and, and it's something that, that kind of weighs on me a bit, um, you know, because we're, we're referring to it as, as compost, and organically it is, but it's, it's still human remains, and it's disposition of human remains. So, you know, people, well, can't you just dump it in the wood? Can't you just dump it in the flower beds? I don't think that's appropriate. That, that's my opinion. I mean, if we're interring, we're, we're laying to final rest veterans, I think it's important not only where it's done, but how it's done. It, it, you know, I'm not throwing roadblocks, but I'm just saying there is a different intangible dimension. Representative Hango. And I think if I could add to that, thank you for bringing that up. And I apologize uh, um, for my cavalier comment about compost, but that's kind of how this was brought to us um, when Representative Partridge spoke to us. Um, so I, I do feel in your case with the Veterans Cemetery that it is a little bit different than um, other burial grounds as we've been told to call them and also um, I would think that a religious cemetery would also <laughs> fall in under that sphere of um, not calling it compost. It is to be, the, the remains are to be revered and, and treated very um, reverently. Um, whereas some people really do want their remains composted in their garden, in their flower garden. So I do think that this is a very special case. Um, so I, I apologize if anything was <laughs> offensive that I said. No, no, not, not at all. I, I, and I think that, that technically, from, from a, a pure scientific and technical standpoint, it, it does meet the definition of, of compost. Um, but it's just, you know, I, I draw the line that it's composted human remains. I, I don't, you know, it's organic reduction, just like leaves or, you know, animal carcasses, things like that. It, it, it surely meets the definition, but I just think that there needs to be a recognition. And that's, you know, again, the personal choice of so much of what we try to do, you know, where people are finding, finding in this particular case, what's sacred to them, what their level of that is. Um, Chris Palermo, if I can ask you a question, because this is really, um, I think this is not, I think it's a little bit more of a concept for funeral directors and for crematorium or disposition uh, facility operators, but you, can you tell me a little bit about the, the permitting process of like, do you need a permit to move a body from a crematorium to a funeral home or to a cemetery or to a place of disposition? So technically in Vermont, uh, which is, is a little different than other states, um, on your death certificate, uh, it has a place of final disposition and a crematory or the act of cremation in Vermont is considered final disposition. So whether you scatter ashes, bury ashes, um, or keep them at home, the state doesn't care because the act of final disposition has taken place. Um, you know, the same is true for alkaline hydrolysis. Um, and with natural reduction, um, you know, there's going to, the act of natural reduction is going to be the final disposition. So whether, and it'll be treated the same way as a crematory is in your statute, or at least your proposed statute, so that um, once that reduction has taken place, whether you scatter them in the woods or you take them to a, a burial ground that can accommodate uh, natural reduction compost, 
Um, that's an extra step that a uh, family can do, but the, the act of reduction is considered final disposition. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. But if you were to take, if you were to take the, um, not, not, well, I guess any remains really to a cemetery, would, is there permitting there too? Or, or I mean, I'm just thinking about what, does this add any paperwork to, you know, when, when, a, when a composting a reduction center has to deliver or, or, or the folks have to come and pick up a cubic yard of, of compost? Right. Um, you know, do they need, you know, who, who is there? It sounds like there's no permit needed for that transaction. So typically what happens now is when, um, when cremation has been completed, we get a certificate of cremation from the crematory, which says the uh, identifies the individual, the container number, the date of death, the date of cremation, and that cremation permit. Uh, as funeral directors, we bring that with us to the final place of disposition, so that um, if we're going to the veteran cemetery or we're going to Holy Cross Cemetery in Duxbury, we bring that form with us. They receive it. Uh, typically on the back of the form, they write down the date of inurnment, the lot and section number, and that either gets filed in their personal files as a permanent record or it goes to the town clerk um, as, um, as, as a burial transit permit would be for a casketed remains in a cemetery so that there is a, a record someplace saying that this individual was buried or scattered in uh, a burial ground. Um, but that's an extra step that we do um, just so that there is some sort of record of what happens to those remains. But if the family took them home and set them on the mantle, there's no, there's nothing beyond the act of cremation um, that would tell anybody that. So when a person goes to a natural reduction facility, I'm assuming that they will get some sort of paperwork that says, this is when it happened, this is the release, and if that family takes that cubic yard of composted human remains and goes to a cemetery or, or someplace where they can scatter it, they would hand that paperwork off so that there's some record of that final placement. Great. No, thank you for that clarification. Sure. Um, any further questions for our guests right now? <clears throat> I think our next steps are to you know connect Lauren and Kate. so the our attorney on this is Katie McLean and um, to do a review of what would make this workable in its best form for for OPR and then we'll return to this soon thereafter. We'll have more conversation about this. I mean, it, it's it's um, <clears throat> represent Murphy. Well, I, and I'm not sure that these are um, the individuals who can maybe speak to this thought, but I, I just, uh, in my time at the post office, we quite often through registered mail did receive um, bodies and in ashes, <laughs> remains. And um, <laughs> it just left me thinking that the transport of a cubic yard is going to be a very different process, and and um, the 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 weight and scale of that is really much more than anyone I think here is picturing. And so, just <clears throat> the the process of where this would be disposed of, you know, the distance of travel. There's there's a lot more to this that I think. Again, the witness who spoke really to the process to the right, disposition. I mean, right. There's a, there's a concept here of the business part of it. You know, well, then even just as a family member, I mean, how do I go collect? I mean, it, it a dump truck. A man. Yeah, <laughs> well, no, I do think that there is an aspect of this that if you're going to choose to do this with your loved one, you've already thought figured that out. Well. Right. I mean, we can do think we can ask the question yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. But when we're talking about handling the remains respectfully, and if we want that to really be part of this, it's kind of like at least understanding what that is when you right. So perhaps we can talk to the so that, who yeah, exactly. the organization it, again. That's what we I'm can saying. explain explain what the business practice is of, of where this is where this right. has happened already because the thought of, of yes there's, there's a lot of different ways to think about it in a um 
in, in any light, but certainly the most respectful light is, yeah. is, is the it's, best way to, to start the conversation. But would that be in rulemaking for Warren or no? I, I don't it know. It could be. Or, it could be. I would, I would be interested to hear the business model and how it's operating in Washington. I, I haven't heard that, but um, that could be something that would be in rulemaking. And I agree with Mr. Burke, you know, regardless of disposition, these are human bodies. Um, I do think I was trying to, to say this in my earlier testimony. I do think we need to always be considering the safety of the public, of our water supply, of um, the the um, financial records, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of money involved in the funeral industry, funeral space, um, and also the respect for the human body. Um, I, I think that's a very serious thing. So I, I would need to understand how the, what the business model is, how they um, help families who make this choice um, move the um, composted human remains to the final, I understand it's not the final disposition legally in terms of the statute, but to the final resting place of the, the composted human remains. I, I do think that's interesting. Maybe it's something that we would rule make about. Um, I just hadn't thought of it until this moment. It's the way we work sometimes. Um, rep uh, representative Chris Plero. Um, yeah, and I just not to add a new wrinkle to this, but one of the things that uh, we, we find um, more frequently now is the fact of, that funeral homes and the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner are seeing an increased incidence of unclaimed remains. And predominantly that is cremated remains, um, but nonetheless, um, you know, families for a variety of reasons uh, don't fulfill their obligations in terms of finalizing arrangements or picking up cremated remains. And uh, there is some statutory uh, provisions now that allows after three years a funeral home or the OCME's office can appropriately make arrangements for final uh, disposition of those remains. But what do you do with compost? You know, um, somebody yeah. walks away and, and doesn't complete, you know, um, their obligations to see it to, the, you know, through the end. You know, how does a funeral home um, or even a facility that's doing this on their own, you know, deal with a yard or more of a composted human remains? I mean, it's, you know, and that's a discussion that's going on within the, you know, funeral directors in Vermont is just that, if this comes to fruition, you know, do we need some paperwork that says that, you know, the family would need to be obligated to pick up these remains at the facility? Because if they come back to the funeral home and the family doesn't come and pick them up or abandons them, you know, what are we going to do for three years with a yard of compost? Um, so there's, you know, there's sort of this endless conversation of what happens. This is all new territory. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but I think conversations with the three states that have a practice, Colorado in particular, and Washington State, um, would be really fruitful to see how they've, how they've handled this and where do we go with this? Because at the end, our role is getting those who have died where they want to go and families where they need to be. And we want to make sure that we get it right. So thank you. Thank you. All right, committee, anything else on page 244? Um, Bob and Lauren and Chris, thank you so much for um, coming in. <laughs> um, for coming in today and um, Good to see you all. Thank you for the information. We're gonna probably pick this up again next Friday, um, but in the meantime, I will connect Warren and Katie McLean. We will perhaps hear from um, again with the, with the woman who testified with us about these questions. 
and maybe make a determination with Lauren about where where the line that gets drawn between the need for legislation against rules and regulations, even for issues like this. Um, so thank you all. Have a good weekend.